Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Lovely to see so many of you uh, and so many, I would say familiar faces, but familiar names anyway in the list of attendees. Um, as you can see on the screen, my name is Nick Sharp. I'm Director of Comms and Strategy at Scottish Renewables. I'll tell you a bit more about SR in a second. Um, but first, I'll tell you what I'll be running through in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we'll be looking at an overview of where the renewable energy industry in Scotland is today. Uh, then we'll be going through some of the technologies that have got us there. Um, then we'll be going on to some of what we call bugbears at the moment, uh, some of the problems, the challenges that are facing this industry as we seek to upscale towards net zero. Uh, and then finally, some of the opportunities, um, some of the really exciting things that, that we're going to be doing in the next probably five to 10 years. Um, one of those obviously is COP, the UN Climate Change Conference in November in Glasgow, for which we have big plans. Uh, the A in the title here, a helicopter view is deliberate. Much of this is Scottish Renewables view. Some of it's my personal view and some of it you guys, the audience and the panelists might disagree with. That's great. Plenty of time for discussion later. So please do put your questions in the chat. Pam, if we could go to the next slide, please. So Scottish Renewables is, as many of you will know, the trade body for renewable energy in Scotland. We've got about 260 members. Um, we are unique in covering all renewable energy technologies. So everything from the obvious wind and solar and hydro through to innovative technologies like wave and tidal, floating offshore wind. Uh, and increasingly we're doing a lot on renewable heat, which I'll talk about at some length uh, during this presentation. Um, we also spend a lot of time thinking about grid and networks and systems and the way that the electricity network is run and paid for. That's vital to our members. Um, we are lucky enough to be able to work across two parliaments, two governments in Westminster and Holyrood. Um, and yeah, probably about three quarters of our members are developers actually go out uh, and build, build projects uh, across all those technologies. Um, the other quarter are the supporting infrastructure that make all that possible. So the lawyers and accountants and insurance brokers, environmentalists, planners, that kind of stuff. That's the shape of Scottish Renewables. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the sector now, Pam. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what you see here is a pretty steep curve in renewable energy deployment. Um, we have tripled the amount of renewable energy capacity that we have installed in the last decade. We have 12 gigawatts installed now. Um, we're also at a place where 90% of our electricity consumption comes from renewables. That is an amazing thing to say. And um, it, it's just surprising every time I say it, I think that that number is so high. And I was on a uh, call yesterday with um, some people from Spain and they were saying they're, they're uh, below 20%. So for us to be at 90 is incredible. Um, that's up from 44% from when I joined Scottish Renewables in 2013, which might sound great. Um, and it is great, but we've hardly scratched the surface on renewable heat. Um, that's half of the energy we use in Scotland. Um, if we're going to meet net zero, we have to decarbonize the way we keep warm and we've got lots to do on transport too. So where does all that renewable power come from? Pam, next slide, please. Thank you. So what you see here, the light green section, if you can't read the words, is that onshore wind is the biggest single technology providing uh, renewable electricity in Scotland today. It's about 70% of installed capacity. Um, together with hydropower and solar, they are our major sources of, of renewable power. The hydro we have is historic. It actually came just after the war with a scheme called Power from the Glens. Um, a lot of those dams that you'll see driving around Scotland are from the 40s and 50s. Um, offshore wind, which is the light blue section there, is the one to watch. That will be increasing dramatically in the next decade, but more about that in a moment. We've also got another almost 14 gigawatts of capacity. So that's more than we have installed in planning or consented, but there are challenges to building that stuff. And I'll go into some of that as well. In a government context, perhaps the most important policy announcement of recent months was the update to the climate change plan, um, which stretches from 2018 to 2032. Uh, that was made in December. The focus for our industry there was on confirmation that by the start of 2021, the Scottish government will publish an energy strategy update, setting out the role of the electricity system to decarbonize other sectors, such as buildings, industry, transport, agriculture. Lots of other measures that are covered in that update I uh, will talk to this morning, but it's also worth mentioning as Gail already has yesterday's budget, which was really exciting for us, actually. Um, I think we were taken by surprise uh, a little bit at the focus on net zero and climate and, and, and low carbon. It was really quite 
quite impressive. Um, budget was focused around a national mission for new good and green jobs. So we saw a confirmation of uh, 100 million pounds green jobs fund, <clears throat> which was first announced in the program for government in September, um, and which echoed our call for a renewables transition training fund. Uh, and we also saw, as Gail said, the creation of a green jobs workforce academy. And that's about ensuring people who are reskilling or facing redundancy can take advantage of green job opportunities as they emerge. Um, I'll talk a bit more about where we think those jobs will come from as we move on. Uh, skip me two slides, please, Pam. I don't think we need to, that one's just words. So we'll go straight to onshore wind, um, which, as I say, is the biggest uh, technology in terms of installed capacity in Scotland. Um, that cool picture was taken in West Lothian at Muir Hall's wind farm when that was been installed. Um, the big story for onshore wind in the last 12 months has been that the technology is back in the energy mix. Um, onshore wind was thrown out of the contracts for difference mechanism um, by a Conservative government uh, for political reasons, really. Uh, after the 2015 election, um, the renewables obligation, which had supported that technology, was ended a year early, caused huge disruption to this sector. Um, we just saw the brakes slammed on onshore wind development. Um, across the UK, but primarily in Scotland. Scotland has two thirds of the UK's onshore wind, so we've been disproportionately affected by, um, by those actions. Scottish Renewables fought for four and a half years to get onshore wind back in the energy system. It was our number one policy ask for more than four years. Delighted to see that happen in March 2020. Um, also brought with it large scale solar, which had been a casualty and unintended consequence of the loss of onshore wind from the energy system. So both those technologies now back in the contracts for difference mechanism, which means they can bid to sell the clean power that they generate. Um, what that means is that lots of issues and challenges which have been simmering away for onshore wind have really bubbled to the fore. Um, we know there are many, many schemes now um, wanting to deploy across Scotland. Uh, we're seeing planning departments face, facing um, pressure from the number of applications they're receiving. Uh, and we'll cover some of those things in a few moments. So to another cool pick, please. This is offshore wind power, of course, um, which is the darling of the UK government at the moment, and rightly so. Um, we are really excited about what can happen in offshore wind, uh, especially in Scotland, because we haven't developed as quickly as uh, the rest of the UK. The UK is the world leader in offshore wind. We have more offshore wind than anywhere else in the world. Um, Scotland's lag behind. Um, first of all, because our conditions are more challenging, we've got higher wind speeds, we've got a more difficult seabed, uh, but we were also held back by a lot of consenting delays. So uh, Scottish Government through Marine Scotland building the way they would consent offshore wind farms took longer than planned, probably by about 18 months. Um, and then some of the first schemes were taken to a judicial review, which um, slowed down deployment for another round 18 months. So we're now three or four years behind the rest of the UK and we're just starting to build out this tremendous promise of offshore wind. Um, obviously, those of you in Aberdeen will see the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre right there in Aberdeen Bay, two kilometres off the coast. Um, further up, you can see the Beatrice um, offshore wind farm from 50 miles away. Um, really impressive projects. And, and if you travel around the UK, you see them in, in greater quantities. Uh, the potential for offshore wind is gigantic. We've got 980 megawatts today. Doesn't matter if you don't know what that means, because by 2030, the Scottish Government think we can have 11,000 megawatts. So that's more than a tenfold increase in the amount of offshore wind in Scottish waters. Um, we had a sectoral marine plan and an offshore wind policy statement from Scottish Government in October, which set out the sites where these new projects can be developed um, and also the tone for the discussion around offshore wind, which is relentlessly positive. It really is something where Scotland can excel. We've got a quarter of Europe's offshore wind resource in Scotland. Um, so lots of opportunity there was some frustration from government uh, from industry. That's uh, not all those sites were taken forward, but that's something we're working on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, quickly through to solar. Um, costs of solar PV panels especially have plummeted. Um, most schemes are now facing government support issues. Um, you'll see on the left there are two types of solar, the, the majority being PV. It's photovoltaic, so making electricity from daylight. In the distance, you'll see a solar thermal panel that actually takes daylight and makes heat 
um, and that's something that'll be important as we do transition into renewable heat. The rather terrifying map on the right hand side is solar irradiation for the UK. Uh, so blue is no sunlight and red is lots of sunlight and you'll see the issue for Scotland. However, what we have in Scotland is lots of land. Uh, and if you look at the east coast of Scotland and the southwest, uh, some of that uh, solar resource is comparable to the rest of the UK. So definitely not a write off for Scotland and we're seeing more big schemes going forward now. Uh, next slide, please. Hydropower. You see here, uh, small hydro on the left, large hydro on the right. Um, those small projects had enjoyed a renaissance under the feed-in tariff. Um, that unfortunately has ended now. There is not really any uh, government support for hydro, which really needs that support. Um, you need to spend a lot of money up front with hydro and then it pays back over 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years uh, of operational life um, and lots and lots of free electricity out of that. But um, government isn't supporting small hydro at the moment. Large schemes uh, you see there on the right, the really big stuff. Um, there just aren't sites for in Scotland anymore. A lot of those sites have um, have been used already. But pump storage hydro is, is a third type. It's a big water battery. So when we have too much electricity, we pump it uphill. And then when we need the electricity, we let it come back down again, run a turbine and create power. Um, we've got the UK's first scheme at Ben Kruiken near Oban uh, and that scheme is ready for an expansion. There's also another project that SSE want to do at Corrie Glass. So uh, lots of small schemes as well. So pump storage has a place in our future energy system and it's something we could do really well in Scotland. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so this is renewable heat. This is what the guts of a renewable heat system look like. It's district heating. That's in uh, Broom Hill in Glasgow. Uh, uses 4.5 kilometres of piping to provide hot water and heating to 700 homes burning wood pellets uh, installed by a housing association. Schemes like this are gonna be absolutely crucial as we decarbonize heat. You can do hundreds and thousands of buildings at once. 98% of Copenhagen is on district heating and they only started doing that in the 1970s. 2% of Scotland is on district heating. So we got a long way to go. Um, projects like this and others using heat pumps uh, supported through the renewable heat incentive. That ends in 2022. Currently for Scotland, there is no replacement for renewable heat incentive. So um, difficult for our members to deploy renewable heat at the moment. But the message really here is there's so much to do on heat and so little time if we want to meet net zero. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And finally, in technologies, Pam, if you could skip on. Um, this is marine energy. Uh, you see in the top left, a tidal turbine, which I'll talk a bit more about in the opportunities section later. Um, tidal surging ahead, but with a limited route to market. The bottom right is Aquamarine Power's um, Oyster device. Um, wave Power really took a hit when Aquamarine Power and Palamis went into administration in 2015. That technology is largely back to the lab now, um, but yeah, tidal surging ahead. So on to the bugbears and some barriers to net zero. Please, Pam, I think you can skip me too as well there. So first of all, one of the, the great challenges that we face in this industry is, as I've said, action on low carbon heat. Um, these two charts show what we're up against. As I said earlier, heat there, the yellow section is 51% of our energy use um, and the majority of our climate emissions from energy. Um, if you look at the top left of that, the purple section is electricity. Most of that is now decarbonized, but only a tiny sliver of the yellow portion is decarbonized. On the right, the graph shows if you Zoom in with your eyes on the top right, you'll see the 2020 target, which is a little black dot and progress towards that target is the purple line underneath. Uh, we've got an 11% target for renewable heat in Scotland. We're now at 6.5. It doesn't look as if we will meet that 11% target when we get the confirmation uh, later this year. Uh, and I'll talk more about heat in the section later on public reaction to change. Um, Pam, if we could skip on to the next slide on heat. The chart at the top shows what the renewable heat incentive uh, deployed for us. And I don't think it was what anyone expected. Uh, the RHI was a, a world first scheme. It was a really brave move by the UK government. Uh, nobody else in the world was incentivizing heat in that way by paying for the amount of heat produced. What the RHI delivered, though, uh, as you can see in the dark green there, is lots and lots of small biomass. So small boilers, probably in individual homes, burning wood chips or wood pellets. Um, 
we know now that probably isn't what's going to decarbonize the majority of heat. Uh, it'll probably be electrification. So things like heat pumps, which are represented by one of the small slivers to the right, it doesn't really matter which one, they're all very, very small. So although the RHI was revolutionary, um, it didn't deliver everything we wanted and there's lots more we need to do. Um, Pam, if we can skip on, please. The next bugbear is planning for our members. This is a big, big deal. Uh, the National Planning Framework 4 from Scottish Government uh, has been delayed for a year because of COVID. Um, that's been really hard to swallow. That's something we've been looking at to provide um, to provide real change in planning, change that's really badly needed. Planning is the thing that can hold back the deployment of all renewable energy technologies from wind and solar to some of the, even the offshore technologies are controlled by planning because they have onshore elements like substations, for instance. A Scottish government statement um, told us a couple of months ago that they will be driving the future planning system based on the overarching goal of addressing climate change, which is great news, but some real stickers still here. Uh, the timelines for decision making at local authority level are very, very long. Um, some schemes are taking years to consent. Um, we did some work a few months ago looking at resourcing in local authorities and saw that the number of planning department staff they employ has fallen 20 percent since 2011. We're now looking at a huge ramp up in the number of applications those people will have to process if we're to meet net zero. That is looking like a real challenge. So, um, yeah, looking for more resource for local authorities to do that. Also, a lot of problems in planning about how national policy is transposed locally. So Scottish government have very ambitious renewable energy targets, some of the most amb ambitious in the world. But local authorities don't often share that enthusiasm and transposing that policy has always been quite difficult. We've also got uh, the opportunity of repowering coming up. So a lot of the early wind farms reaching the end of their lives developers need to decide what to do with them. In many cases, that will mean taking down turbines and replacing them with newer, bigger, more efficient machines to get more power out of the same site. We want to see that process prioritized in planning so that we can do it quickly uh, and we can move through, especially where communities are now used to hosting wind infrastructure. Um, and we know that popularity in those areas is quite high. Uh, it'd be great to capitalize on that through repowering. So skipping on Pam. grid is a real challenge um it's it's the way that electricity is transported um around the country as you'll know you see these pylons uh around around as, as you go around your daily lives the problem is that this system was built to take power from thermal plant so you would build a coal or an oil or a gas power station or a nuclear station near to a center of population you wouldn't have to send the energy very far you could bring the fuel to the generator. What we have now in renewables is the fuel is out in the highlands of Scotland and we need to take the generator, that's the wind turbines and the hydro plants, we need to take them to the fuel and then we need to transport the electricity back again. The system isn't really designed for that. It was built in the 50s and 60s. A lot of reform going on in grid. Um, the recent Rio process, for instance, uh, told us how much network companies will be allowed to invest in future, and that's something that Ofgem, the regulator control, we saw welcome progress on a number of issues, but left with some significant concerns. Key to that is that generators, oh, sorry, uh, grid companies want to be able to build extra capacity, so more wires before the before it's needed, so that we can then build more generation. At the moment, that situation is flipped on its head. We think that every decision Ofgem makes as regulator should be guided by net zero. Um, and that's something that, that was addressed by the Prime Minister in the, the, his 10 point plan um, a few weeks ago. We'll probably be seeing some reform to Ofgem. Um, another problem with grid is charging, who pays? That is a really difficult question. And it's one that um, is flummoxing policymakers at the moment. And it's taking up a lot of our time as a trade body. It's a real concern for our members. So skipping on Pam to the opportunities, tidal energy. This is one I said I would touch on again, and I will. I was uh, sitting, putting these slides together, and my eight-year-old son was sitting next to me doing his homeschooling, and he was entranced by the spaceship on the screen. Uh, it's not a spaceship, it's Orbital Marine Power's new Scottish-built O2 turbine, the largest tidal turbine in the world. We've got more marine energy devices in Scotland than the rest of the world. Um, I did swither about whether 
title was a bugbear or an opportunity, but the benefits of getting this right are enormous. Um, the tide is a constant. We know when it's coming and going. Everywhere in the world that has sea has tides. Where this problem, where this becomes a challenge, is that government are uh, focused on cost reduction before deployment. Um, so cutting costs before we build out lots of projects. What we've seen in offshore wind is the more you build, the cheaper it gets. Um, and we need government help to deploy so that we can reduce costs. So there's no viable way really for tidal developers to sell their electricity at the moment, but that's something that we're really focused on. Uh, skipping on to the energy transition, um, I see we're running out of time. This will be something that uh, many of you will be involved with um, uh, in the audience here. Um, it encompasses so much from skills through to hydrogen, CCUS, of which I'm sure we'll talk more in a moment. Um, so much is written on this subject. We had an integrated energy vision recently from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and the OGTC. Um, some of the investment that's needed to deliver that will come from the public purse, but the majority is going to come privately um, as we look to decarbonize offshore production um, and, and act more uh, swiftly on decarbonizing oil and gas generally. On CCUS, the Climate Change Committee have said it's non-optional. Uh, it's a technology we must build and use to reduce emissions, particularly from industry. Um, and that's somewhere that investment uh, will really be flowing in the next uh, five to 10 years, we believe. Finally, hydrogen is a really hot topic in renewables. It's somewhere that we we'll see play a significant role in the future. Um, I'll just quick slip quickly through, Pam, the next slide, which is the COP climate change conference. Many of you will know is coming to Scotland in November. Um, it's given a great opportunity for us to push government to act more quickly. Um, in the year of COP, both governments want to be seen to be climate leaders, and that's something that we've been able to capitalise on so far, and we'll keep doing that through 2021. And Pam, finally, to my last slide, which has one of my favourite cartoons on it. I won't read it out to you. Um, I believe that, that changing our energy system to a low carbon one is one of the biggest comms challenges the world faces. Uh, it's, that's why it's fascinating to be uh, in, in my job at the moment. Um, really, really exciting. We know that public um, demand for action on climate change is at an all time high. Uh, we've seen the popularity of renewable energy tick, tick, tick increasing over the last five years in the UK government's own surveys. What, where we are at the moment, though, is, is we've decarbonized all that electricity, but we've done so in a way that hasn't really affected people's lives. When you flick the light switch, you don't know whether the electrons that are powering that bulb are green or brown. The next steps, however, are going to require consumer behavior change. Um, I was reflecting on this. Things like the plastic bag tax was hugely successful because it tapped into people's desire to act on climate change, but it didn't mean they had to change their behavior in any significant way. The same is true of reusable drink bottles and to an extent electric vehicles as well, uh, which is succeeding um, in many cases. Now we've got past that first adopter um, piece. A lot of the success of electric vehicles is based on how cool they are. Um, nobody's really had to do that in a way that they've been forced to do. So if we really want to tackle climate change, um, people have to change their behavior. And one of the things that we're going to be seeing is uh, demand response is turning down the amount of power that you use at a specific time when we don't have the supply to provide it. And that's something that can make a huge difference to the amount of carbon we emit and very little difference to everyday lives. And the technology that's coming through in smart systems means that we'll be able to do that in future using things like the batteries and electric cars without even knowing we're doing it. That's where the really exciting stuff is. Um, so yeah, some really exciting studies as well. I was speaking to some academics recently about how they view that change and um, what we need to tell people to do uh, to make a low carbon energy system efficient and effective at cutting, uh, cutting carbon emissions. So energy is so fundamental to everyone's lives that, that this is really an enormous challenge. And it's a, it's a communications challenge at the end of the day. Uh, and it's one that really does have implications for the future of the planet. On that kind of grand note, um, I'll say thank you. Uh, I'm a couple of minutes over. So thank you to Big for having me. And I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A.